About 15 years ago, on first reading Ezra Pound's book, Culture, I noticed at the introduction to the volume, and it was dedicated to Louis Zukovsky and to Basil Bunting, Strugglers in the Desert. Well, at that time, I knew neither name, but in later years came to know and admire very much the poems of Louis Zukovsky and to publish some of them, and to hear a bit more of his English friend, Basil Bunting. In the interim, I had uh, been able to find a rather fugitive copy of a small edition, Basil Bunting Poems 1950, which was published by a man named Dallam Flynn by the Cleaners Press in Galveston, Texas. Well, this is a very rare edition indeed, and uh, still left the whole uh, question of Basil Bunting and his work very, very mysterious in my mind. And so finally, after these years, upon coming to England, I, f I find myself in the village of Wylam on Tyne, in the county of Northumberland, northern England, and uh, able to talk to Basil Bunting himself. And uh, I'm, I'm asking him to read for us um, five or six poems, several of which uh, have never been available. And, uh, but first, before he talks about, uh, before he reads the poems and discusses each of them, I'd like uh, to have just a sort of a very, very general uh, background from Mr. Bunting and uh, to tell us at this point in his life and so on why he is in Wylam and uh, what sort of connections he maintains with, quote, the English literary scene and uh, with such people as Ezra Pound and, and Louis Zukovsky. Well, first, uh, how is it that you are living in Wylam? Well, I think the uh, desert that uh, Pound found Zukovsky and myself struggling in was pretty dry and pretty wide. Zukovsky is still struggling, and I hope he ultimately gets across, but my bones were presumably left bleaching on the sand hills some distance back. Yes. Uh, I live in Wylam, partly because Northumberland is my home, and uh, partly because I can't get any jobs anywhere else. Wylam is a pleasant enough place, but uh, I have not had the kind of leisure you need to write poetry for many years now. Most of your poems are, in fact, uh, uh, about, what, uh, 30, 30 years uh, old by this point. Um, let's go back to the 20s, say, and, and uh, tell us of your first literary associations, how you came to write, and uh, so on. We began long before that. Uh, I don't know how these things happen, but I remember sitting on the hearthrug in my father's sitting room at a time so remote that the grown-ups around me were talking about the Russo-Japanese War, which was then taking place. And uh, it was suddenly borne in on me with violence that I was and must remain a poet. I can tell you nothing more about that, but the conviction never wavered through the whole of my life that that was my necessary destiny. Uh, well, this takes, this takes you back to the cradle, practically, doesn't practically it? Practically to the cradle. And it was a difficult job, because I knew nothing all over about poetry. Uh, my father took an interest in Wordsworth, more, I think, from the point of view of a man who liked climbing in the Lake District and who liked birds and beasts than from a really poetical one. Still, there is a lot you can learn from Wordsworth. And uh, that was all I really had until my teens. Then there was the usual array of stuff that boys went through in those days. I never saw any modern poetry until I was nearly 20. I suppose it must have been in the year 
1919, and I'd written many poems and burnt nearly all of them up, uh, when first I was shown a volume of Ezra Pound. And uh, in the same year, I probably saw Eliot's first book. I think we might say that uh, in 1919, you were, in fact, uh, 19 years old, isn't that I correct? I was 19 years old then. The uh, surprising thing to me was to find that Mr. Elliot included in his book some poems called Preludes. It had been my conviction then already for some years that what needed to be done to make poetry alive again was to revive its connections with music and make them closer. The essence of poetry is the same as the essence of music. And uh, I felt that there should be some way of using in words the forms that had proved useful to the great composers. I tried the wrong ones first. Uh, I was pretty well bound to the attractions of polyphonic work are so great that uh, it is difficult to reconcile oneself to the fact that the poet has only one voice. He cannot make half a dozen voices sing at once. And that limits the range of what can be taken from music. When the people write things and call them preludes and nocturnes, it may or may not be that they have uh, Chopin in mind. I think something can be taken from Chopin, perhaps. Uh, but the most fruitful looking thing seemed to me the sonata. The way themes are contrasted and uh, variations upon them made, the contrast between one movement and the next, and yet the way the whole thing can be hung together and be recognizably one piece architecturally. And right from the first, and before I had read any modern poetry, that was my aim. Uh, it was one I have found very difficult to uh, make headway with, and uh, from my first surviving attempt at a sonata poem, which was Villon, written in 1925 and revised in 1930, uh, till uh, The Spoils, written about 1947 or 50, 1950, I think, there uh, had been a continuous struggle which I think is only solved with the spoils. Mr. Elliot, I think, had some of the same notion, uh, which led him to his four quartets. And uh, his greater skill uh, led him more rapidly, and without the corpses I've left trailing along behind me, There's another uh, point which has been made by the modern poets, which I also had first stumbled on before I met with any of their work, uh, the exploitation of abrupt changes of tone and of feeling in a poem. Uh, which is to be found in Pound and first uh, popularly exploited in the wasteland, had interested me as it occurs in the Odes of Horace. I read them with great care in 1917 and for a good many years I was trying to do uh, 
what I thought I had caught Horace doing here and there, changes of tone which are hard to follow and yet perfectly logical and give the poem the an architecture of mood rather than an architecture of form, which uh, I should say, an architecture of mood which should be added to the architecture of form. Uh, I'm wondering, um, you were speaking of um, thematic variations and, th and this kind of flow that comes from a consideration of musical elements. I'm wondering if uh, Pound at this point, or yourself at this point, uh, had already come upon this sort of notion of uh, a, a collage in terms of sort of a visual organization, say from from calligraph or, or uh, character ideogram and so on. In other words, I, I think of the collage as being essentially from a device taken from art, but uh, uh, in other words, being able to place simultaneously next to each other uh, very disparate elements. In other words, not necessarily musical. Do you think this is just another aspect of this, or, do you, or, or did you find this in music? Because uh, it is the illusions and the fantastic uh, speed with which um, the mind uh, seizes on these things that is kind of a problem in, in the work of, of, uh, of certain poets. I think perhaps you are trying to set together the two elements I mentioned, the musical one and the, the sudden change of tone. Uh, there are various possible ways of achieving it, but I don't think it is necessary to go outside the traditional poem, that is the poem as a, a piece, uh, a spoken verbiage, words. Uh, Apollinaire's calligrams and various other attempts of the sort, the strange typography of uh, Cummings seem to me well they, they have their place like all experiments but to be something outside the range of uh, poetry which it is necessary to, to use you can manage the effects without uh, the typographical tricks without the drawings without even such decorations as Blake interwove with his poems in his own editions of them. Let's talk for a moment about uh, this whole business of, uh, quote, stylistic influences, unquote. I've, uh, I've heard uh, yourself and uh, such men as, uh, say, Charles Olson and uh, even Zukovsky accused by uh, academics and people who don't read carefully that... Uh, they are simply uh, imitating a style. And uh, would, would you talk on that for a moment? I don't think I, uh, sure, Zukowski doesn't, uh, imitate a style. What perhaps we do is to make use of processes other men have discovered. That seems to me right and necessary. There have been fruitful investigators of form and of poetical uh, detail. Uh, Chaucer invented much, but it was, of course, free to anybody to use the forms that Chaucer invented, and most of them have been used steadily ever since. Uh, the same thing was done on a rather smaller scale, but with great skill by Wyatt. It was done again magnificently by Spencer, and it has been done in our own time by a man who has an array of invention, I should say, equal to Spencer's. In many respects, uh, a man from that point of view parallel to Spencer is repound. I think any poet who neglects to make use of what he can take in the way of form and of organization from Pound is neglecting his business. Uh, what, um, at the moment, um, 
do you feel much um, sympathy or kinship with what is going on, say, in England or, or in America? Or is it um, the, the fact that, as you said earlier, uh, you, you have been unable, in a sense, to maintain your, right, your, your poetic career? I know terribly little about what is going on. The, uh, I've lived always abroad, which made it a little difficult. Then the great uh, break of the war. Then after the war, I was living in Persia, again remote from all contacts. And uh, since I was thrown out of Persia by Dr. Mossadegh, my life has been one merely of struggling to keep my belly filled and my children's belly filled and uh, there's no time whatever for literary preoccupations. So in other words, uh, London to you is not uh, not the center of uh, a literary universe in which you take part? No. Uh, London was attractive to me for two or three years when I was very young and uh, since then, every visit has made me feel that I like the place less and less. But I don't like any large towns. Only three big cities ever seemed to me the kind of place a man could live in without being miserable. And they are all a long way away from me. <laughs> yes. Would you, would you mind telling us just, just to... Uh... The best, the pleasantest city to live in that I know is Isfahan. That's Persia, isn't it? Yes. The next is, I should think, Naples. And the third is, or was, at the time when I knew it before the war, Los Angeles. Well, that's very, uh, the latter is a very curious choice, I suspect, that many of us will feel. <laughs> uh, it may have changed a bit. So you were there in when? 19... 1939, last time I saw it. 1939, well, that's it's difficult for me to say, never having seen it in those days. Um, I would ask you to read uh, four or five poems, and uh, perhaps it might be of use, particularly in the case of this long poem, The Spoils, uh, for you to uh, preface, preface the reading with remarks on them. Now, f first you're reading a, a preliminary brief ode. This is from the period, is it, of the uh, interest in Horace and... Uh, yes. Dating back, to, dating back to the 20s, or, or even earlier, is it? The Little Ode is quite, as my poems go, recent, from the 1940s. Uh, it is only meant to suggest that the result of a work of art is rather more than the sum of its parts. As to the spoils, I think that a poem must stand by itself. It should stand without comment as a thing in itself. But uh, I'm quite willing to say that uh, the general intention of the spoils, apart from the intention of a particular form, a particular musical form, a particular musical organization, is uh, to be an elegy for the people killed in the last war, especially for my friend Kai Eidema of Grand Rapids, and to contrast to some extent the preoccupations of warlike and violent people with the life of the artist preoccupied with line or uh, with verse, enjoying life, which you get in the slow second movement of the poem. Yes, yes. Then we're having, um, let's see, the next one is um, The Lament of the uh, Morpish, Morpethshire Farmer, which I believe you've told me is uh, perhaps your most uh, well-known poem, anthologized and so on. That was a violent diatribe against uh, the uh, very selfish Northumbrian landlords of my youth. Things have changed. The war made a great difference to the profitability of uh, good farming. It also made good farming compulsory. Uh, 
And finally, uh, during the years before the war and after the plantation of the great forests in Northumberland has completely changed the outlook of the Northumbrian hill farmer and uh, what I think was possibly a slightly exaggerated but uh, nevertheless on the whole true picture of the hill farmer's plight in uh, the late 1920s would be quite a false one now. How about the um, next one is uh, Attis, isn't it? Attis, the less said about Attis really the better. Yes. Uh, the intentions were satirical. Uh, they were very complicated satirical intentions and uh, they date from a time so long ago that uh, the mood is difficult to recapture and explain in detail and might be incomprehensible to the younger audience today. I think, however, that the people who are hit at here and there in Atlas, uh, who have seen it at all, have uh, not gone entirely unscarred. The, uh, the last of the poems is um, Chomi at Toyama, and uh, this is a poem that I asked you to read because it's, it's always been uh, perhaps uh, my own personal favorite of, y of your work. And uh, could you, in a funny way, uh, it seemed hearing you, hearing you read it today, at, uh, in, a, in a curious way, perhaps uh, you, you yourself, in a sense, have come to a position rather like uh, Chomei, or Chomei. Well, I hope I shan't end as disillusioned as I imagine Chomei <laughs> to have done. Uh, it's... Uh, not in any way written out of my own experience. It's my reading of translations of uh, a great Japanese book, uh, one which I've never ceased to enjoy in uh, the rather heavier and more learned style of translation, very different from my own 